So Seamus, I hear that you're dying, but not of COVID-19. Right? It was really a pleasant surprise to not die of the main thing. Uh, you might remember last week I talked about how I was pretty sure I'd been exposed. Like, I was in the same room with my nephew for 90 seconds. And yeah. the next day, he he fell ill, got tested, COVID positive. So, th I said that last week. Last week, on the day that the podcast went live, I got sick. Fever, congestion, sore throat. Ah. Uh. Um, that yeah, was pretty scary. I mean, you know, one week after being exposed to a COVID person getting sick. But no, it was the flu. It, my mom actually went out, actually went and got tested and came back negative for COVID. I assume we have the we had the same thing because my illness did not last long. She tested negative for COVID but positive for flu strain B. Hmm. It's like Dang it, you couldn't even get the A strain. You had to get, like, the second tier one. You couldn't even get the good one. Mom, I only want triple A flu. Oh, sweetheart, we have flu at home. You don't need that. Well, that is B-grade flu, Mom. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. So, I, I had a very similar experience uh, after some family came and visited during the holidays and they went back home and they were going to go back to work and they got tested and a couple of them were asymptomatic COVID carriers, apparently. So then we were all like, oh, no, maybe we're exposed and we're asking everybody and everyone's getting tested. And um, then I started having loss of smell. I was like, oh, man, this oh, is no. it. It's going to be this is the end. And uh, so I went and got tested and no, I, I'm fine. And it turns out it was just like allergies, probably because the, there had been some rain earlier that week. And so, you know, all the pollen and all the plants and stuff go crazy around here. Rain is very, very rare. So. When it rains, right. all the plants are just like, whoa, make hay while the sun shines, kind of thing. Amazing. So we both had this similar, oh no, this is it. I The holidays are over, people are, are done fussing around. I mean, we didn't even have any of our big gatherings that we normally did. We kind of skipped it, but there were still like, uh, you know, I need to drop stuff off or those kinds of things. There was still... You know, being in the same room with somebody usually while wearing a mask or whatever, but even that will be even that is over now. Oh, of course, um, Heather was at risk because you know she cares for old people, and some of them had visitors, and there's nothing you can do about that. She just you know wears her mask and crosses her fingers, right? And you don't want to cross contaminate if somebody gets sick. Yeah, that's a, right. That's a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one. Yeah, like if one of your clients gets you sick you don't want to pass it on to one of your other clients and i mean especially the people she care about she cares for are in both cases she's got two different families she's working for and they're both in their 90s and they're not taking it super seriously because you know they're friggin 90 they're not taking anything seriously <laughs> it's like right. they are not they are not in tune they're not up to date they're like, well, if I take a shower and fall in the shower, I could die. Or if, you know, I get right. COVID, I could die. Eh, whatever. I'm already 90. I've already beat the odds by several decades. And they're just so set in their ways, and it's hard to get them to do And it's hard for them to, like, remember and, you know, engage in new behavior and change their normal behavior patterns. Right, right. My parents were kind of the same way. It's weird. The people are most at risk are the ones who are hardest to get to take it seriously. I don't know. Right. I'm sure there's some older people that are taking it really seriously, but my parents are both in good health. Um, and they're what, like 70, 60 and 70. And uh, so and, the, and they're like, eh, I got bored of this. It was just it's just like I'm bored of, of like all this this carefulness. I just want to, right. you know. They're not going right. to the cinema or anything because they're all closed, obviously, but they're not going out. But they're also like, hey, let's have a family dinner. Let's get everybody together. And so all the kids are like, OK, we got to figure out like who's been exposed to what and who's been tested recently and all this stuff. And they're just like, yeah, eh, whatever. Yeah. And you figure I really sympathize with that because as you get older, you're just you're you, you, almost everything that happens has happened before. Oh, there's a war. 
you know, I, I went through that when I was, you know, decades ago. I remember the last war. I remember the last economic crisis. I remember the last technological upheaval. I remember the last time we had a new generation of kids that didn't listen to their elders. It's like it feels like right. nothing new under the sun. And then this is kind of new, but it uh, you're also used to the young generation getting worry, worked up about everything. And it's hard to treat this one differently than the last dozen world-ending plagues that rolled through. Right. My uh, my neighbor has a... She's, she's much older also. She's in her, I think, late 70s. And uh, still gets around, does her own gardening, that kind of thing. And... Um, I asked her, how are you doing? Like, you, you stay away from COVID? And she's like, oh, I've already had it twice. The first time it almost killed me back in March, but, you know, the one in September wasn't so bad. I was like, what? <laughs> Crazy. What, what are you doing? <laughs> I figure by the third or the fourth time, I'll be looking forward to it. Change of pace. You call that, you call that COVID back in my day. Back in my day, it put me in a ventilator for three weeks. <laughs> this new COVID the young people have these days. Hmm. Well, that's enough talking about the real world. What's happening in the virtual world? Uh, for me, nothing. I see we have VR in the show notes. Um, why do we have VR in the show notes? I haven't I haven't worn a headset. In, Seamus, in this like is your weeks. show. <laughs> what is going on here? I don't know. Is this not your topic? It's not my topic. Huh. I wonder, so I must have put this in the show notes last week, and I probably had something to talk about, and now I have no idea what it is. <gasps> I remember now. Oh, yes, <gasps> I remember. I remember last week I saw George Weedman review. Okay, a few months ago, Isaac got um, the Oculus Quest 2. And we both used it, you know, like a lot of people, you first get a VR headset and you use it a lot and then you taper off. But we both kind of regretted not getting a better set headset. Hmm. For kind of felt like, oh, all these other ones are probably better. And, you know, all the road not taken, you know, regrets. Grass is greener kind of thing. Yeah. And then I saw George Weedman's review of the Oculus, uh, not the Oculus, the HTC Vive, you know, Valve's big. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have they changed it recently? I know they had one like six years ago or something. I, I, you know, I haven't been following it that much, but he got it this year. And for me, I thought it was the gold standard. I really like regretted, oh man, you know, I wish I could try one of those. They sound so wonderful. And based on... George Weedman's review, I started to think, you know, I think the Quest 2 is actually really good in terms of price <laughs> versus what you get. And the Vive seems just ridiculously overpriced. You know, seeing mm. another headset and all of its drawbacks and the things that George Weedman talks about as being advantages are like things I don't care about. Like, oh, wow, it, you know, it's not that heavy on your face. And I'm like, well, that never really... That's not one of my concerns. Right. My concerns are always... My big gripe with the Quest is the, the cable, the USB cable that you plug into the thing so you can use it with your PC. That cable wants to come unplugged all the time. It is just super slow. It's not a very deep plug. It's a very shallow mm. plug. So it doesn't... It only takes a slight bit of of force to get and that's a real gr gripe like i'll reach up slightly tug on the headset to like adjust it on my face and doo -doo, oh no headsets unplugged <laughs> which means you got to shut down the game and steam and steam vr and sometimes even steam and the oculus app and restart them all to get back in the game like none of it wants to reconnect once it's once the usb is disconnected it just like they all throw up their hands and go well it's the end of the world. I think usually Windows like reassigns it to a different COM port when you plug it back in, even if it's exactly the same device with the same serial number and everything. Right. Right. And the old ones are just like, well, I'm not looking at any other COM ports. I'm just going to look here. And I'm just going to wait for it to come back forever. I'm going to hold my breath. <gasps> and then that's it. <laughs> you just got to like go to Task Manager and euthanize it. So... 
I, I guess I'd been regretting our quest to acquisition until I saw George Weedman's review. And then I was like, you know what? Quest 2 seems pretty good. Nice. Yeah, they don't put the drawbacks on the marketing materials. No, they don't. <laughs> you can just imagine listing them on the box. Very uncomfortable. We'll leave deep red marks in your face after prolonged use. Collect sweat. Foam interior <laughs> collects sweat and body odors for hours. <laughs> and then the marketing guy trying to spin those, right? Like, like they have to put all the downsides on the box, but they don't have to say that they're downsides. So it's like face <laughs> sauna. <laughs> so what do you think we should do some of these mailbags yeah that sounds like a good idea dear avada cadavra wizards i'm sorry I, I don't know if i pronounced that right i don't speak nerd i picked up the age <laughs> of empires definitive bundle during the steam sale only discover that age of empires definitive edition had not only improved the graphics and sound but also changed units factions and even removed and replaced sections of the campaign what's your thoughts on what remaster should be should it remain faithful to the original game or should a remaster make sweeping changes where they see fit in order to appeal to current sensibilities thank you for your time sincerely grimware so let me just have a measured response by screaming heresy as loud as I can. Um, yeah, I'm I'm offended. For me, that's Isn't not that something... Isn't that supposed to be like a, a remake, right? Right, like a remake is where you try and make a new version that's better. And a remaster is just you touch up the, you know, make it run on modern machines, update the aspect ratio, maybe make the graph, you, you know, update the sprites or texture maps and and stuff like that you, you should do all the, the sound design re-record right. all the stuff that the programmer did in his cubicle <laughs> right. oh it should be cosmetics only for a remaster like if you if you change the gameplay or the campaign then you're not remastering it you're you're making a sequel or a remake or a remix or a redo or a rehash. spiritual successor right yeah, so I I find this very off-putting, especially changing the changing units. Like, wow, you're going to change units. Now, it's possible neither of us being Age of Empires 3 uh, camp followers, as it were, that there was some sort of modding community where the modding community like arrived at some thing that was quite slightly different from the the main game and that they're honoring the community by incorporating those changes or something i'm just trying to give them the benefit of a doubt sure sure maybe maybe that's some maybe this is what and also there's the question of what you do to a game that's been updated a great deal over the years you know oh we released 10 different patches over three years and that made sweeping changes to the to the gameplay and some of those changes mm, right. were controversial. Then when you do the remaster, it's like, well, do we go back to the original as it was released? Or the original that it was patched to that some people didn't like? Like, that's an interesting... What do you do there? I don't know. I, I don't know what the yeah. right answer there is in terms of do you honor patches? But... I agree with the, the gist of what Gr Grimware is saying here. Messing with units and factions seems very iffy in a, in a remaster type situation. In the, later in the question, the whole thing will be on the, in the show notes. The, um, he mentions that generally it's frowned on to change art in movies and TV shows, although in games it's not quite so bad. And I think that that's, that goes back to the differences in the mediums where a TV show or a movie or something, the art, the visuals are the primary factor. Whereas in a game, the mechanics are the primary factor. So yeah. for, like, for Age of Empires, changing the unit types is a, a serious departure from the original game, even if they looked exactly the same. Yeah, like imagine th they did that... Um remaster of Star Trek The Next Generation where they, you know, updated it for 
you know, went back to the original film they shot and got a clean capture of that for HD, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if while they were doing that, they also recut the episodes and like dropped scenes, inserted new scenes, changed, you know, kind of re-edited all the shows to like fix plot holes or mess around or... Oh, here was this cut for, character for political reasons to make them more right. uh, palatable to today's audience or something. Oh yeah, here's this person. Here's this joke that will not would not fly today, and we've decided to pretend it wasn't in the original show. Just Riker to totally disappears from the show. <laughs> Every scene where Riker talks to a woman is taken out of the show. Right. Oh no. Um, yeah, that that is a bit what it's like. When you mess with the gameplay, you're messing with the heart of the material, which is what it would be like to do structural editing on a completed thing. And yeah, the I didn't read Grimware's entire email, but Grimware brings up the Lucas edits of the original trilogy and how those are still controversial. A sore point, yeah. I, I still want to see the originals again. Like, I want to see them without the Lucas things. You can get them on Pirate Bay. I know, and you can't buy them anywhere else legitimately. I think Disney's leaving some money on the table here. The re unremaster. I know there are, there are people working on it. Even now I see updates on YouTube. People talk. There are several different public projects where they're trying to remaster from various... You know, somebody gets a hold of... Uh, of course, we never had a digital version of the original. Right. Yeah, ours were all VCRs. <laughs> right. And some people taking, I don't know, TV versions. Maybe somebody got, like, the, the theater version and somehow mastered that or whatever. But they have to go back to the old versions of the movies. Or they have to re-edit the new stuff to try and match the old and change color grading and there's this huge effort of people trying to preserve the original movies as they existed in the 70s and i just think disney could save the world from a lot of that by just releasing the originals just sell them and, and they could charge people for them yeah yeah i'm not suggesting give them away for free goodness no i mean i know we're talking to mickey mouse here <laughs> I'm saying you're you're leaving money on the table here, Mickey, and I know how much you hate to not make money. <laughs> I was going to do a Mickey Mouse impression, but we're all better off without that. Okay, fair enough. Dear Diecast, one of the things that drew me to 20-sided was Seamus Pixel City Project, and I've long been a fan of programming series. So when I found an article talking about video game graphics by a guy who worked on Ask Creed 4 and Witcher 2, link in the postscript, he mentions that he wanted to create a glittering snow effect, but that anti-aliasing messed it up, which made me wonder. Given that 4K gaming has started to become a thing, TM, are these kind of blurring and anti-aliasing technologies going to become more of a hindrance than a help in graphics? Looking forward to your thoughts, as well as another year of diecasts. Bail, Tim. Thank you for the question, Tim. This is an interesting one. For, for years... Back before, I, my current machine is a beast, and I generally can just leave games on high settings and, and not worry about it. But back in the day, when I had my older computer, um, the first thing I'd do, oh, I'm getting 20 frames a second. Go in, find anti-aliasing, turn it off, and oh, look at that, I'm getting 30 frames a second now. Like, that was a really expensive effect for, to me was a very small impact on the final image. And this seems to be a generational thing. I am not... <clears throat> the problem that anti-aliasing solves is that shimmering effect where some pixels change greatly from one frame to another. Happens like along hard edges, you know, this wall is really bright, but it's against a dark background, and as you move around, you'll see the stair steps of the scene between the two. And right. 
you can kind or, of see or the very uh, distinct patterns like um, high contrast More. textures and things in the distance. When the sampling gets low enough, you can get some really weird noise effects where the the colors are jumping all around or pixels are flashing from black to white or white to black or, or you get weird patterns especially with like um checkers or stripes like if you got a fence yes. with a bunch of posts uh you can get some very strange effects with with the when the sampling rate gets low enough where you know it's off in the distance somewhere right you get like moray patterns mm, yeah and um i think i just you know i began my first you know first person games was like Doom and that game by modern standards if you play the original Doom and you know with none of the graphical upgrades people have given it over the years it suffers from tons of shimmering if you head directly for a brick wall as you get closer and closer to it you'll get lines appearing and disappearing frame by frame and all kinds of shivering waving effects because there was this was before mip maps, so walls at a distance right, would just skip. Right. Would yeah, they just skip pixels. And um, that's another thing that really improves it. It used to be that there were no mip maps. It was just one. A mip map is a low quality, uh, or a low resolution rather version of a texture that's used when the object that's being textured is far away. So it's kind of like anti-aliasing is built into the texture, and it eliminates the problem of textures shimmering. Uh, even without right. the anti-aliasing, because it's built into the the way that the texture is sampled, it's pre-anti-aliased, kind of. Right. And then for years after that, um, back when I was doing stolen pixels for the Escapist, that was a screen cap, a video game screen cap comic, and often I'd have to like Photoshop individual images, you know. Oh, I need this character, but I need them standing in a different scene, so I'd have to cut them out. That's way easier when you have anti-aliasing turned off. So not only was it, like, really expensive and hard for my computer to do, but it made my job harder. So, right. so I just always, like, that was, like, the first thing I did. Start up a new game, find anti-aliasing... Especially, especially full screen anti-aliasing. It's like, no, turn that off. It makes my job harder and my game slower. And so over the years, I think my brain just learned to filter out all those shimmering effects that, that people worry about. Like, I see young people talking about, oh, it's so distracting. And I can see it when you point it out. You know, if somebody's talking about it, I can see it. But when I'm playing the game, I generally don't think about it or notice it, really. It's also a way to get higher resolution out of your current monitor. If your monitor has pixels that are big enough that you can see individual pixels, then and you're playing a game where looking at things is important off in the distance, like PUBG or something, then turning on anti-aliasing can help you because it gives you more visual information on the screen. So you can play the game better it's actually a, a performance or not performance but yeah game perform it helps you perform better in the game right if you have it render at like 4k and then what's that called super sampling and then sample it yeah. down to uh to your 1080p monitor you will get information that wouldn't just wouldn't have shown up in 1080p yeah and that's what well that's not always what anti-aliasing is but a lot of times anti-aliasing is 2x or 4x where it's sampling at a higher essentially sampling at a higher resolution and then scaling it down right yeah so i for me it's like um if you've ever looked at a window that has fingerprints on it but you don't notice the fingerprints all over the window you just look out and you're noticing the scene outside but if you do start noticing then you can't stop noticing how dirty the window is it's one of those things like <laughs> how did i not know this uh, notice this a few seconds ago and now i can't stop noticing it for me that's what aliasing is just not not a big deal and obviously a bigger deal for um younger people now the 4k gaming thing i don't i i can't comment on that i've turned up a few games to i forget what my native resolution is hang on let me check okay so my native resolution is 2560 by 1440 and yeah, um, i'm pretty sure that's 2k okay that's 2k i I, 
I put games on that and it just, I don't get anything out of it. I can tell if you switch between that and 1080p, I can tell which one is the higher resolution. But when I'm playing the game, I'm not like at 1080p, I'm not like, oh, this is so blurry and there's no detail. I've been using 1080p for years and I don't get the wow. You know, when you go from 800 by 600 to 1024 by 768, that was a big deal. Going from 640 mm -hmm. by 480 to 800 by 600 was a big deal. Going from 320 yes. by 200 to 640 by 480 was a big deal. But this bump from 1080p to 2K is like, oh, I think I can kind of, yeah, that, yeah, right there where the HUD is, I think it's a little bit crisper. Lean into the monitor. Yeah, that's definitely slightly crisper. And it's just not worth it. I mean, it's not worth it for taking up four, having all the footage take up four times as much hard drive space. Yeah, and all the textures have to be higher resolution, and then the loading times get longer because the textures are higher res, and then all the right. models have to be loaded in earlier because your view distance has higher model resolution, and so then all the loading times for those get longer, and it it just becomes a, a crazy thing. Where what's the What's the upside, right? Right. Oh, it's slightly crisper. And also, Isaac edits my videos, and he's using my old computer. And so when he, I mean, it is agonizing. The jump from 1080p to 2K texture, to 2K video for him, is a difference between a, a video that renders in 15 minutes and a video that renders in like two and a half hours that's how big a difference it is oh wow yeah it's just brutal on him so i don't I, you know i don't want to do that to him because that ties up his computer for like a whole afternoon it's to, and if you've got to render it more than once like oh wait right. oops we forgot something or there's a bad edit we need to correct for it Oops, there goes another two and a half hours. It's just, that's not worth it. 1080p forever. Yeah, it does seem like 1080p is a very sweet spot for resolution. You remember the good old days? I mean, the bad old days? I mean, the old days when there was, like, all these weird aspect ratios on monitors. You'd have, like, the oh, yes. 1440 by 1280 and the 1440 by 1080 and the all the weird... And then you'd have all these strange resolutions and... And you're trying to figure out like what resolution to play your game in, where maybe your monitor was one thing, but your graphics card could do something else, and and then the yeah. game only had certain uh, options. I had I suffered from that for years because I had a monitor that was sixteen by ten. And of course the standard now is sixteen by nine. And everything is sixteen cell phones, sixteen by nine. Every monitor you buy, 16 by 9, but there was this weird 16 by 10 thing going for a while. And it was like half the games would support it and half the games were like, oh, that's weird. I'll just take my 16 by 9 image and just crush it <laughs> to fit it onto your monitor. It was not good. Or, oh, yeah. or my monitor would try and accommodate it and it would be weird or parts of it would be cut off or distorted. Oh, it was awful. I think I still have a monitor, a flat screen LCD monitor, like the first one that I bought, because before that it was all like CRTs and take up your whole desk. And uh, the first one I bought out of college and I had this flat screen, it was, I think I still have it. I think it's a 10 or it's a 1440 by 1080. So is that by, is that 16 by 10? I don't know. It It's yeah, a weird a resolution. Yeah, that is not 16 by 9. That is weird. Yeah, well, it was before 1080p was a thing. This is back in, like, 2007, I think? Oh, weird. Yeah. And it had this it has weird problem, too, where, like, one corner started, like, the pixels started going bad, but it, it was, like, spreading slowly, like a tumor with little fingers going out into the screen. Weird. And then, like, it stopped growing, and then it started shrinking. And now it, it works again, except for like a few little pixels. So it's just, it's it's the the monitor that won't give up. But it's this weird resolution. So I got it like the kids have it on their their uh, their gaming PC. 
That's a way to do it. Kids don't notice aspect ratio problems. <laughs> yeah. They don't notice anti-aliasing. They don't care. Well, and plus the, the computers now, and like the operating system, all the games and stuff, they don't really care what resolution because it's all dynamic. It's not like it's baked into the, the source code or anything. Right. So anti-aliasing. Yeah, I think that... Uh, I think that it's not as important as it used to be, especially with, like we said, MIP mapping is almost universal now. Um, and if people have, if people want to have a high resolution experience, they now have the option to buy a high resolution display. And if people don't want that, then they don't buy a high resolution display. And either way, you don't really need anti-aliasing anymore. But right. I'm not, certainly not one for good graphics. Like I, I, I like Minecraft, where the, the pixels are like a quarter of the screen in size, so... <laughs> right. And the other thing about um, anti-aliasing is it does... the This email mentions a glittering snow effect. And I like stuff like that. I also... I know everybody hates bloom lighting, but in certain games, I love my bloom lighting. Especially in cyberpunk. Mm, yeah. When the world's made of neon and it's meant to feel kind of dreamy. Yeah. I, I wish I could turn up the bloom in cyberpunk. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's like a filter you can apply on your on your graphics card at the graphics card end, right? Where it's just like double bloom or something. <laughs> double, well, I, I just put Vaseline on my monitor. And so that, that <laughs> gave me this wonderful... Just smear Vaseline on my contact lenses. Oh, that would have that would have been a lot harder. That would have been a lot easier to clean up now than I think of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that dreaminess. I mean, it depends on how much time you're gonna spend reading reading text within the world. But if it's just all about sort of looking out over large distances and creating a mood then yeah, Bloom is a good thing. But uh, the, the point I was getting back to is anti-aliasing often interferes with other effects. It's like you blur everything, but then every slight, slight discrepancies in pixels can... It amplifies any shimmering that's under there that isn't completely destroyed by anti-aliasing. Like, it's made to smooth over sparkling pixels, but if any pixels do sparkle through they it's even more noticeable because it'll be this big bright thing that like gets smeared out over a large area and will vary from one frame to another so i guess bloom mixed with sparkling pixels is can be a disaster yeah and, well, and it can go both ways you can have problems with where you turn off anti-aliasing i was watching a streamer once who was playing satisfactory i think and he had anti-aliasing turned off but bloom turned on and the textures in well the textures the materials i guess are are uh, a lot of them are very uh, what is it specular there's a lot of specularity on some of those alien yes. plants or whatever yes and they have a, a lot of bump as well talking. and so they uh as you're moving around the sun will reflect off and it, they don't just reflect off in this nice patch they reflect off in these little tiny points and we have anti-aliasing turned off all of those points are super bright because it's just sampling one point per pixel. And so, and then of course those super bright points get bloom. And so you've got this weird glittering flashing effect all over anything that's reflecting light. I run into this all the time in unity. I'll be messing around with something. And like you said, like a metal, a metal wall with a lot of specular on it. Let's say there's rivets on the wall and every once in a while, yeah. The pixel it draws just happens to be that perfect pixel that lines up with the lighting and catches a glint of sunlight, but just for this frame. And on the next frame, yeah. it'll be a different rivet. And so, yeah, you'll have this sort of... And without anti-aliasing to smooth that over, you'll have this one pure white pixel that moves around and is then blown up through bloom. And yeah, it is weird. It is this weird full screen flickering sparkling snow globe effect and it looks very wrong. You don't want your whole scene to be a disco ball. Right. So there we go. We came all the way around.
I mean, round the block. Anti-aliasing is outmoded and, and, and no one needs it anymore, and also you really need it all the time. I, I agree. Whose turn is it? It's your turn. I, it doesn't start with Dear Diecast. I don't know how to begin emails like this. I'm just frozen. It's like in you movies do this when somebody just... Thing and just like backspace the intro and type Dear Diecast. Diggity Dear Diecast. This is like in movies um, when somebody just picks up the phone and begins talking and it feels weird. I just <laughs> right. oh, I can't deal with that. I can't cope. There's a call I, at 1 a.m. or whatever. The guy rolls over and picks up the phone, and the first thing is like, is like don't say anything. They're listening to you. Do his guy's like that. <laughs> Wait, if they're listening to me, aren't they listening to you too? If then why are we talking on the phone? <laughs> also, I'm tired. Go away. Anyway, I know that in my world, my weekend tabletop outings came to a sudden halt in March when our region started their lockdowns. We moved to online systems like Roll20, Tabletop Simulator, and Board Game Arena, but none of these ever had that same feel of going over to a friend's house, arguing over a communal map, or haggling face-to-face -face and exchanging tokens by hand. What systems are you using to run your distance tabletop games? Have you recovered the family board game night? Will 2021 be the year of pen and paper throwback video game? Is Among Us really just Mafia for politicians and streamers p.s i definitely was at least one of the 115 people who listened to last week's podcast i hope this question gets your 2021 off to a roll i read the pun i fell for it <laughs> i don't know folks you get the show you deserve either way you send us puns you get puns hey, this person did not say sign their email um, I'm gonna call you Brad. Dear Brad. There we go. Thanks, Brad. Well, Bradley, I know in my world, my weekend <laughs> tabletop gamings are none of your business. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously I'm not playing tabletop games now, but, um, like I, I've talked about this on recent things, and I've never been into board games. I find board games really irritating. Um, so... I am, I've had, everybody, here's the thing, everybody in my family loves board games but me. So they'll get a new board game and they'll be out there and I'll hear the, this was a bigger deal when my old, before my oldest two moved out. You know, my three kids and my wife would gather in the living room and play board, and play some board game and have a wonderful time for hours. And you know, I'd just sit in my office and play video games. And once in a while, they'd be like, come on, Dad, come on out and play with us. And then I would just come out and be bored and not have fun. And then they would realize it was a bad idea, and they all felt bad for making me come out. And so they stopped doing it. So I don't know what the deal is. I mean, to answer this question, will tabletop games survive 2021, kind of involves understanding what's going to happen with the pandemic and i'm not qualified it's like you know there's supposedly a vaccine by right now and depending on who you listen to that's either going to solve all our problems or nothing's going to change and this is your life now is hiding in your home all the time wearing a mask inside of a bubble breathing oxygen from a canister i i don't know Every few months the story changes. I'm not a friggin' scientist. I'm I'm not a, a COVIDologist. Ah, okay, back away. Back away from the current events and the politics, Seamus. Back away from it. Yeah. It's okay. You don't have to do this. You don't have to throw yourself over that edge. <laughs> I'm just saying, I have no idea. I think to answer this question, I would have to have some guess. And I've been making guesses for the last year. Like, I've said things like, this will blow over soon, and this probably isn't as bad as it seems. And and after, you know, being wrong and having all my intuition based on previous experience constantly proven wrong, I've just thrown up my arms. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no guesses. Um, so, will tabletop games survive? I don't know. I hope they do, even though I don't play them. I really think the hobby itself is super healthy and a good thing. I think it's a wonderful thing 
for you to have kids do also. Like every kid should have some experience with tabletop role playing. I think it's super healthy. Even if they don't stick with it, just like that one experience, if they've got the slightest interest in it, let them play it and see what they do with it. Because it, you know, collaborative creativity. Like, that's a good skill to have in, in, in the world today. <laughs> where so much of our, where so much of our economy is based on, you know, technology that you build with other people. I think there's two kind of different things going on here. One of them is the question about like role playing games, tabletop role playing games, and the other is like tabletop board games. And those are kind of pretty different. Like a, a board game is much less yeah. creative and uh but also more relaxed, I guess. It doesn't require so much investment and so much engagement. Right. Whereas a, a role-playing game, like, from the GM, absolutely requires a huge amount of concentration and and presence. And then also from the players, like, I was, I've played in a lot of tabletop role-playing games, um, but I've never been very good at it because I was never, like, engaged with it. It was kind of like, like you are with, with board games, where I was just like, ah, I'm just not into this. Like... I'm playing this because I wanted to hang out with these people, but actually I'm an introvert, so I was over that in the first, like, ten minutes, and this right. game session is two hours long, and so it, right. it never really, yeah, it never really worked for me. Um, so, to the degree that people like it, I think they'll probably keep doing it just because it's it's fulfilling a need that, that, they, that they have and, and something that they enjoy. Um, I don't think people will just stop unless it wasn't something that they were interested in in the first place. If they're just doing it, you know, if people are just playing these games in order to satisfy some sort of uh, family requirement for family time or something, then yeah, it'll probably go away and it'll go back to, I don't know, whatever it was that people did before that didn't involve sitting together, uh, going to the club or something. Um, You're talking about the old ways in the in yeah. the in the before times. Well, so it's so weird because for me and my wife and all my kids are all fairly introverted. So like we never went out to do stuff, like ever. We just we we didn't go out. We would do things at home, and so the pandemic hit, and it was most the main change was that we wouldn't go over to our siblings' house in in town. And uh, one of them, one of my brothers is really big on table game, tabletop games, um, not role playing, but just like, you know, board games, Euro games, uh, you know, fancy stuff. And so right. uh, he would bring games over, we would go over to his house and play them and, and we would do that kind of stuff. So for us, uh, the pandemic has seen a decrease in the amount of getting together with people and doing board games, because when we're at home... We just play Minecraft or, or stuff. I mean, we have do occasionally play like um, uh, there's a few there's a few board games that we have that we'll play, but uh, it's it's not a common thing, and it it wasn't before, and it hasn't now, and so it uh, it hasn't really changed our our behavior. But for people who are extroverts and who are used to going clubbing or whatever and can't right now and are doing tabletop games instead. Yeah, it may very well be that that is a that's an ongoing change. That's like, well, you know, you don't have to travel so far. You don't have to, uh, you know, get so far out of your element. A lot of the places are probably out of business now anyway. And uh, you know, playing these games together is a way to to get your social stuff without leaving the house. So, I mean, again, speaking from an introvert, that sounds great. But uh, I think maybe right. extroverts may may enjoy it as well. And like you said, with your uh, your kids and your wife are all more extroverted uh, than you, maybe not than the general populace. And, uh, and you know, they were able to get their social energy going by playing board games together. Yeah. Dear DieCast, I hope this question finds you well. I'm a bit late to the party with this question, but as you may know, in August 2020, Unity... Let's see, in August 2020, Unity started trading as a public company on the New York Stock Exchange. What I found very interesting is that, to this day, 
they have yet to turn a profit. Now, I know this is normal for companies these days, but I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Keep being awesome, Lino. Thanks for the question, Lino. I believe it's Lino. Ah, oh, I guessed. I just I was going to play it off like I knew, but no, I was wrong. I believe uh I believe at some point in the past, Lino said rhymes with Dino. Ah, okay. Well, I I I'm not as good with remembering these things as you are. Uh, which is terrible since I'm pretty bad at remembering it. So we definitely have the <laughs> the blind leading the nearsighted here. I did not know that Unity was not turning a profit. That does seem kind of weird. That does because you. I mean, I'm used to tech. I mean, that's pretty much normal these days. Tech companies just running losses for their first several years, but. Like, how old is Unity? Let's have a look on, on Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia, Unity was announced and released in June 2005, which means people were working on it before then. So is it, it is at least 15 years old now. Wow. 15 years of not making money. Uh, Man, I'd love to have a project like that. Man, can you imagine right? working on something and not having to make money on it? You just keep getting paid for nothing. Right? So that is sort of alarming to me. I mean, to me, that's fine if someday when they go under, they just you know, release the source for all. But if they if they get eaten alive by creditors, they won't be able to do that. The creditors will own the source, and of course the creditors will be like, mine, 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 my precious. And, you know, every game that doesn't have the source will will die. You won't be able to do updates. You you know, you will never get a newer version or whatever. If you if you're if you published a game in 2008 using Unity and now you want to do a remaster, you can't unless you start over. Yeah, it seems very odd. Like, it's possible that they're doing it as some sort of tax evasion thing, where they're trying not to pay taxes because they never make a profit. I don't know. It... It, it, it is sort of alarming. It doesn't make money. I mean, I'm not surprised. I've been using it for years and I've never paid them any money. <laughs> right. But I kind of thought, you know, some projects do release games using... And I, a lot of these projects, it isn't that... Um, there are no profitable projects that use Unity, but you don't want a finite the, the vast majority of user unity users are bedroom projects that have no starting capital even if you made the the engine super cheap a thousand dollars for a game engine that's you know chump change to a game studio that's nothing to a game studio but that is unacceptably expensive to most bedroom programmers. The vast majority do not have a thousand dollars lying around to spend on that. Right. They probably spent that much on their computer and it was more than they could afford. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And there, and also the big thing for me as an indie developer, if you don't know, I don't know if this platform is what is going to work for me. I don't know. Should I use Unreal or Unity or Godot? Well, if there's a paywall there, I'm not going to pay $1,000 to get through the paywall so I can try it and realize, oh, I hate this engine. And they haven't made money in 15 years, and now Godot just came out last year, which is totally free and open source. So now they're they're up against free open source competition. Like, does this company have a future? Is Unity owned by anyone? I know like there are Unity some engines that are owned by Yeah, by like yeah, larger not... studios or something. 
And then no, they're also like kind publisher. of a side product. No, huh? Yeah, that's it seems strange. Odd. It, it, the only other thing I could think of is that they're um, they're trying to. No, yeah, I don't know. It, I already already mentioned that it's possible that they're just doing as a tax thing, but yeah, hmm, strange. I, I guess neither of us are are um, financially savvy enough to be independently wealthy, so probably we're not savvy enough to understand why they would do this. Right. Well, I think it's just you can't do it. In, I mean, if you just ask for money up front, you just won't get it, and your your project will die now. It'll it'll just nobody will download it. Nobody's gonna pay to get through a paywall, and nobody you know yeah. wants something. And it's it's like, I mean, I think they're headed in the right direction. What you want to do? Okay, you made a million dollar. You made a million bucks with your video game using our engine. We should get a cut of that. On the other hand, oh, you released a little tech demo and you know it made you a couple thousand bucks for six months work we don't want a cut of that that makes no sense to try and make money off of those people those people are themselves losing money <laughs> like right they're like if you can ship a game and you spend six months shipping some some indie game that you know makes ten or twenty thousand dollars you've lost money because you're evidently a professional programmer, and you could have earned a lot more than that just getting a job, using your, your very hard to you know your very. Your skills. Those are valuable skills to have. So you are already in the hole if you have an indie game and you make it in six months and it makes twenty thousand bucks, and then you got to pay taxes on those twenty thousand bucks. You lost a lot of money. And it doesn't make any sense to try and make money from that person. So I yeah. think Unity, Unity's pricing system makes sense. They're set up so that, you know, if you're below some threshold, they don't even want to talk to you. It's like, whatever. Just do do your thing in your bedroom and don't bother with us with it. But if you start to make a big professional thing, then then I think they want to cut. And that makes sense. In the part of the question that I skipped, he asks, uh, if you were Unity, how would you go about making the company profitable? And if I were running it, I would do the the uh, non-profit route. I would say, like, hey, this is a free open source thing. If you want to donate to it so that we can keep doing this, great. You know, here's how you can donate to us. And then... Uh, you don't have to, you don't have to go chasing people for money because ostensibly the people who have made a bunch of money off of it will give you a kickback for it, and uh, then you also don't have to be profitable because the whole point is that you just have enough staff to consume whatever donations come in. Hmm. Yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. But by by making themselves a publicly traded company, you're sort of announcing your intent to become profitable. And if you're not profitable right. yeah, after yeah. 15 years, then what are you doing? Yeah, that is seem that does seem very strange. Uh, on the other hand, what Tesla is has Tesla turned a profit yet? Uh, I haven't checked in the last year, but as of 2019, last time I checked, no. So, yeah, there's something weird going on. I mean, I understand running at a loss until, you, you know, it's like companies keep getting bigger and bigger and more and more complicated, so it takes longer and longer to get them off the ground. But at some point, it becomes infeasible. It's almost like rockets themselves. It's You could build a rocket, you know... A child can build a rocket that'll go over their house, but one that is capable of achieving orbit... Um, requires the best scientists in the world to work for years and then and then probably have it blow up on the platform on the launch pad anyway. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah just, the margins are so thin. Right. And 
And that's how it is with well, big maybe companies. Well, that's, maybe that's what's going on here. The margins for Unity are so thin that they just they haven't made a profit yet. They will eventually, before the heat death of the universe, but not yet. I mean, it seems like they ought to be able to turn a profit. I mean, at some point you have to like, all right, well, who in our staff is necessary? <laughs> right. Probably yeah. programmers. You have to figure out, what's our budget? What, what are we actually going to pay for? And and what happens if we don't pay for this guy? Is Are we going to go under? No? Okay. Sorry, this guy. Right. And people don't like to think of it that way. But it's like, if you don't get rid of this guy, then next year you're going to have to fire everybody. Or, you know, whenever the money finally runs out. Yeah. Yeah, it's very it's very weird. You'd think that the incentives offered by being on the stock exchange would be of the nature that would make you turn a profit, but apparently right. that's not the case. It's weird. Or maybe it will be the case. Like it started what August 2020. Do you, do you know if if they've turned a profit since then? I I didn't look it up. I'd be surprised. This is not the year for making money. Yeah, probably not. Maybe they're just angling for a bailout. Maybe. Let's do the last email. Dear Diecast, the end of Flash is nigh. I think it's more than nigh. I think it's here. Will this spell doom for a massive slice of web history, or will it be easily bypassed with browser plugins? Is it a necessary upgrade to the web security or just more big company shenanigans? I would be very interested to hear your thoughts about this. Best regards, Henry Chadban. Oh, Chadban. That's such an interesting last name. It sounds like we've decided to ban all Chads on this site. <laughs> no answer for your question, Chadban. Luckily, he's named Henry and not Chad. Oh. Um, I think... I mean, we did kind of cover this a few weeks ago, and I thought it was hilarious. You know, it's like, for for me, the only thing that really stings is the loss of Strong Bad, the original format, being able to experience it as a Flash website and not having to view it on YouTube. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of games that were written in Flash, games on the web, there and were. a lot of stuff on Newgrounds and stuff. Um, I, I never played a lot of those. Most of them were garbage. Though. Yeah, yeah that, that, right. And we've got and we've got um, itch.io, where if you're itching for just miles and miles of garbage, of free games, <laughs> of questionable quality, those still exist. Yeah, if you want to put on your waders and go for a real nice walk, slog through the games then uh, you can do that. It's just you can't do it with, you know, the ones made 15 years ago. So we have lost a big slice of web history, and that is sort of heartbreaking. And it does sort of seem like, well, what are we doing to preserve the past? We, you know, we shake our heads at the people of the past who, like, taped over old episodes of Doctor Who. It's like, you, you fool, you had a... TV show, you produced it. Or not just Doctor Who, there were American shows. They'd just make a show and broadcast it to the air and then not record it. And of course, those would be incredibly, those would be of incredible archival value today. We would love to see those. And there's no way to recover them. They are gone. Right. The residual of those TV shows is right now, um, about 50 light years from Earth. <laughs> Scattered over oh. a massive area and unrecoverable. On the other hand, for years there have been data vacuuming sites that will archive plain HTML and images. Um, but Flash and stuff has been, if I'm not mistaken, along with PHP sourced pages and other dynamic web stuff remarkably difficult to archive and people knew this when they were making these these content you know websites and things and they did it anyway and it's kind of a 
it's kind of a nod toward being more interested in present flash uh, to, <laughs> to use the you know flash and glitter uh, than it is toward making something that is useful both now and in the future and I think that I mean they're getting the people who made these things are getting what they wanted they you know they're now out of date and you can't get them anymore and that's what they wanted they wanted to have that kind of you know momentary uh, glitziness ephemeral yeah. ephemeral content yeah and I can understand that like thinking now in 2020 2021 you know, if I make some content, it's easy to think, well, nobody's going to want to read this in 2035. But, you know, my website started in 2005 and is still here 15 years later. Like, it's, you make something, you think in 15 years, nobody will care. But then 15 years later, you're like, boy, I wish some of that stuff from 15 years ago was still around. Like, the future cares more than you think it will. This is also yeah. true. I mean, that's that's the whole Y2K problem was pff, we're not going to be running this code in the year 2000. We'll probably be, you know, enjoying our flying cars by then. Uh, <laughs> right. As and, if you wouldn't need a power plant when there are flying cars. It just, it's just right. so short-sighted. Right. And so you're there in 1978 running code laughing at the idea that this code would actually be running in 2000. That's ridiculous. No, this will all be rewritten. And then it, there it is. You've retired years ago or you died of a heart attack in 84 and your code is still the throbbing heart of this company in 1998 and nobody knows how to maintain it. Ah, uh, yeah. And yeah, Flash so but as far as Flash goes, like I, I I don't think that it's a big problem. I think that the the vast majority of the content, strong bad aside, that was made with Flash was made as a either as a easy way to do animation, in which case it can be reserved by video, or as a incredibly over the top, cumbersome, difficult to produce, difficult to navigate, and hard to use version of HTML. In which case, good riddance. Right. The, the the interesting parts of it are the historical aspects of it. Here's what the web was like in 2005. And that'll be something that, you know, some young people just can't, you know, they never experienced, they can't even imagine. Oh, why would somebody make a website every time I'm trying to like press this button and it, you know, it's, it's animation makes it hard to press and it's so noisy. Uh, yeah, it's, I, that hasn't been part of my normal web experience ever, I don't think. Like, I, I ran across sites like that occasionally when I was doing work and I needed to contact a vendor or something or figure out, like, what this weird product is that someone was selling. You go to their site and it's like, it starts loading up their web page and I'm like, nope, right. I'm going to call them on the telephone. Right. Oh, I remember the days of, like... Please wait while we load our website. And you're like, what are you talking about? It's a website. And then you realize it's this flash-driven abomination with animated words and sounds and things slide out and pop and jiggle. And it's like, I, I, I didn't come here to play Mario. I came here to, like, see the things you have for sale. <laughs> right. Right. They, and the crazy thing is that they're... They're supposedly like a professional website. It looks professional, but it doesn't look professional. It looks like you're trying to run some sort of like nightclub. I don't know what you're trying to do here. Right. Speaking of the web of the past, have you heard of NeoCities? I have not. It is a throw a deliberate throwback to GeoCities. Ah. <gasps> It is, I mean, with the sensibilities of GeoCities, where anybody can open up a web page and make it look as shitty as they want. Um, I, I scrolled through it earlier today and was struck. It was just like overwhelmed with a sense of nostalgia for wildly impractical web design. 
I was actually oh, so excited. I was tempted to just make a copy of my blog, not the whole thing, just the front page, you know, and like take my blog and like take the photographs of dice and mask them out poorly, like dice on a white background, mask them out poorly. So they've <laughs> got like this really bright white edging and then throw it on a black background. <laughs> so it looks right. like it's been cut out improperly and if you can find under construction gifs, you know, the guy. Oh, yeah. The, the, yellow, the guy digging at that pile of dirt with a pickaxe that says under construction. And he's, of course, animated. Of course, the gifs must be animated to be as distracting as possible. Right. Draw as much attention as possible to the fact that you have no idea what you're doing and will not be completing this website in the foreseeable future. Right. I wanted to just like do the front page of my website. The, like go do the 20 sided blog or something like that. Right. And then like go through and like, change all the fonts to some weird like oh, yeah. goofy Comic fonts. Sans. And or, like or and just every other word color. is a different color. <laughs> <laughs> just like agonizing to read. But, you know, and it's so much of that, I mean, we make me fun of it, but so much of that was just kids. Like, how many, how many of those pages were kids cutting their teeth on HTML for the first time? I mean, yeah, this me. is... I did, I did my first website on GeoCities, I, and I took I almost how... all that HTML, and I put it in my current garbage-looking website. But, I mean, I, I sometimes I forget how young you are. Because I was, of course, 30 at the time and you were a child. The The difference in our ages seems much, you know, you're in your 30s and I'm about to turn 50. That's not that big a deal. We're both adults. But, you know, roll back 20 years and I'm in my 30s and you're a child. <laughs> right. Um, but really, I mean, you know, in generations past, this would be something you put on a fridge. That's what GeoCities was. It was like the global fridge for kids that hang up their latest creation yeah yeah it's like yeah it's like tween drawings right and so i love that it's back i love that it's back even though it is of course ridiculous and impractical it's also a wonderful creative tool and i am looking forward they even have they have tags which are, are going to recreate web rings. Do you remember web rings? <gasps> yes. Okay. I still read Freefall, which is part of a furry webcomic web ring. And they still have the little web ring thing on their, on their front page. And it's like, every time I go to that web comic, I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, the good old days. The good old days in gigant with the word good in gigantic air quotes. Well, this is before Google. How are you going to find other content, the kind right. that you crave? Yeah, yeah, before Google, it was just like, what are you going to search for? You're going to ask Jeeves? Jeeves, Jeeves doesn't know how to find what you want. Jeeves has no right. idea. Jeeves is just going to send you the Microsoft web homepage every time. Uh, man, we complain about Google being this horrendous corporate big brother which it is and it is and and deserves complaint but it's better than just being adrift in the sea of information and having and not even knowing which way's up better than yahoo oh those were dark oh, times man. alta vista was serviceable i totally forgot alta vista existed <laughs> right it, it was it was fine to tide us over until Google came along. Right. I never I was I got to the web too late to use Gopher, which was the search before big search engines. I don't even know how Gopher worked. But mm. like Yahoo. We had AOL for a while. And so we would just search uh, yeah. via AOL search or whatever. Right. Yahoo supplanted AOL, which supplanted Gopher. I think Gopher was like maintained by hand or something crazy. I should look up how oh, that worked. Wow. 
I mean, you know, back when the population of the internet was less than a million people. Right. Yeah, yeah. And there was you could just have one guy who knew where all the websites were. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, we're yeah. Before the eternal September. That was a weird world. Oh well. This has made me oddly nostalgic for that middle, the adolescence of the internet in the late 90s. Or maybe that's the childhood of the, no, it's probably the adolescence of the internet in the 90s. Anyway, I feel like we've done a show. Thanks to everyone for so many great questions this week. If you've got questions for the show, our email is diecast at shamesyoung.com. Thanks so much, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Not this week, Seamus.